All right, we're going to begin with a, a little bit of review from last week and then uh, get into our study for tonight. We're looking at uh, prophecy and uh, the return of Christ, specifically uh, the rapture of the church and timing of that in the pre wrath rapture is what we're presenting this month. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, last week we looked at uh, five different rapture positions and kind of gave an introduction to the pre wrath position. We'll go over a little bit of that this evening again. Uh, tonight, uh, where the Bible speaks of the church in the during that 70th week and the timing of the rapture is associated with the church. And then look uh, at First and Second Thessalonians, comparing what Paul says to what we looked at last week in Revelation and uh, Matthew 24. Next week, some of the difficulties I've had anyways with pre-tribulation position and a couple of words, uh, imminence, which is not a biblical word, and parousia, which is. We'll look at those two subjects uh, next Sunday and then wrap it up in two weeks uh, from tonight. And again, this is an important verse, Acts 17, 11, uh, the importance of searching the scriptures daily. Um, these ones heard something they hadn't heard before in Berea, but they received it with a willing mind and then they searched it. Is this true or not? They didn't reject it out of hand. They didn't say, it's not worth my study. Uh, they listened, they thought about it, and they start, searched the scriptures. Last week, um, again, if you weren't here last week and want what were uh, some of the charts, or the back table um, has everything we looked at, not every specific picture and everything, but the outline part that you filled in, that's on the back table. So if you weren't here or if you were here and just want this copy as well, feel free to grab that on the back. Um, we compared Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, a preacher in the last week of our Savior on earth. Uh, prior to his crucifixion, with Revelation 6, uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ isn't just John, but John's writing down with the Lord revealing to him, and how Matthew 24 um, goes exactly as Paul, or as John, excuse me, wrote down in Revelation chapter 6. There really isn't any distinction. There's some minor wording differences, no real distinction between the two. This is the pre wrath position. Um, and just to use a marker here, again, here's where we're at here someplace uh, prior to this rectangle. Um, the Antichrist signs a covenant which kicks off the 70th week of Daniel, uh, seven years in length. The first three and a half years of that is called the beginning of sorrows. That's what we looked at last week, the Matthew 24 and Revelation 6 passages. Um, then the Great Tribulation starts after the midpoint, in the middle of the tribulation, exactly, of the 70th week, three and a half years in, uh, the Antichrist steps up into the temple, demands to be worshipped as God, and, um, and that just sets off a series of events up in heaven. At that same time, there's war in heaven, Satan's cast out, and comes to the earth knowing as, with great wrath, knowing his time is short, and he unleashes the worst time in human history. It's called the Great Tribulation. Matthew 24, 21. Um, Satan's desire is for that to at least last the three and a half years, if not longer, but the Lord cuts that short. He, he says that's enough, cuts that time of uh, Satan's wrath short, raptures the church at that time, and then pours out his wrath upon the world. So Satan's wrath is there. God's wrath is there. And the church faces this, all this, but the church does not face God's wrath. So that's uh, the essence of the pre-wrath position. Included with your handout tonight, we're not going to really look in depth at this, but just to uh, give an overview of the book of Revelation, just chapter by chapter, or a couple chapters at a time in some cases. Um, possibly soon after this, if I got a job. Um, we'll be going through the book of Revelation on Sunday night. So, and if so, this will be the study that will be kind of the guideline, the outline for it, if you will. Um, but uh, 22 chapters, and it's not chronological. This next chart, and this is available by request, just because it costs money to print color ink, so I didn't reproduce that. We don't have a color copier. Um, 
But if you'd like this slide as well, I can either print it off for you or send it to you, send this particular thing you print off yourself. But, um, but it's not quite a lot. It kind of goes back and forth a little bit. Orange and green mix a little bit. Green and purple mix a little bit. There's what the colors mean. And uh, very few people think that the book of Revelation is chrono strictly chronological in order. If you think that, there's a lot of troubles that you'll get. The Antichrist doesn't come down until way down there after the seal, the trumpet, the vials, they're all finished. Well, not quite the vials, those are afterwards. Um, but anyways, that's a um, presentation of a chronological order of the book of Revelation. Again, if you like this slide, just let me know and we'll produce that. Okay, search for the church. Um, where is the church during the 70th week? And what does the Bible say about where the church is? Um, it is one of two places, either in heaven or on earth. And of course, individual believers who have passed away are members, part of the church, they're with the Lord in glory. But in terms of the living believers, where is where are they at? Search for the church. We're going to Try to answer that. Again, strictly searching the scripture, we'll be quoting a couple of people, what they've taught, but uh, really searching what the scriptures say. The word church, first of all, is going to be uh, what we'll look at for just a moment uh, because those who hold the preacher position place a lot of weight on um, the word church itself and where it is and isn't found in the Bible, specifically in the book of Revelation. One argument in favor of the pre-trib rapture position is that the word church is absent. The absence of the word church in Revelation chapter 6 through 19. Um, it's in the opening chapters. It's mentioned once at the very end of the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 16. And that's just kind of agreed. It's not really describing anything doctrinal about the church. It just makes the statement of the church is greet you or something to that effect. But... Uh, not a doctrinal statement concerning the church, where they've been for the last seven years. Um, but the church, the pre-trip says that since the word church is not found in Revelation 6, verse 19, which is the section of scripture, if you looked at that, your outline on Revelation, that's described in the 70th week. Since the word church isn't found there, then church must not be on earth during that time. Here's a couple of quotes. Um, two people that you probably have heard of, one that maybe haven't, but uh, he's the more contemporary one, still alive to my knowledge. Lehman Strauss. Anybody heard of Lehman Strauss? Okay. Um, Bible teacher. He's been passed away probably two or three decades at this point now. But from 4 1, that's Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, to the end of the book, all the events follow the rapture of the church, or after the rapture of the church. By this time, God will have completed his church, and the church will have completed her mission on earth. And then highlight a part, in fact, the word church does not appear again in the book until the end, where the glorified Lord speaks to the churches, Revelation 22, 16. So, again, that's not his only argument, but one of the proofs that the church uh, is not here is that the word church does not appear anymore in the book. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, anybody heard of him? Okay, he's a current guy, he's Jewish, uh, Bible, Jewish Christian, Bible teacher, and um, fairly prominent now. And he said this, very similar statement, the church is clearly found in chapters 1, 2, and 3, dealing with the events prior to the tribulation. Later, the church is found in chapters 19 through 22, although... He actually is wrong on that in terms of the word church. It's only mentioned one time, chapter 22, verse 16. It's not mentioned in chapters 19, 20, or 21. Uh, but he says later, the church is found in chapters 19 through 22, dealing with events after the tribulation. But in chapters 6 through 18, which deal with the tribulation period itself, the church is not even mentioned once. So again, he's using that argument to state that the church is gone. J. Vernon McGee. We've all heard of him, I hope. Okay. What has happened to the church? From chapter 4 through the rest of the book of Revelation, there is no mention of the church, except when you get to the invitation at the end. From here on, you will not find the word church mentioned. But now the church goes off the air. There's no mention of it. 
It has gone off the air because it went up in the air. It was caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the air. Uh, good play on word, but again, his point, same thing as the other two, and I could almost ad infinitum keep repeating different teachers, commentators, etc. say the same thing. One proof that there's no, that the church is not here during the 70th week is because the absence of the word church in those chapters describing it. Okay, here's something they never mentioned that I've ever seen. Let it be. The word church does not occur in chapters 4 and 5 either. It is their claim, pre-trib claim, that the church is not on earth because the church is in heaven. And there's group mentioned, heaven, 24 elders mentioned, chapters 4 and 5. But the word church is not mentioned in the book of Revelation, probably in chapters 4 and 5 of the book of Revelation. So if the argument is they're not on earth because they never mentioned chapter 6 through 19, the same argument can be made they're not on hev in heaven because they're not mentioned chapters 4 and 5 either. Um, they've got to be one or the other place, but you can't say that they're not in one because they're not mentioned because that applies to both heaven and earth. So that's not an argument to even worry about, uh, the absence from a of the word and arguing from silence, silence is never right, it's unsound, it's never a good thing to do. But there's that's a defense against that particular belief. Number two, the events of chapter six and eight. How many did the homework assignment last week? How many remember the homework assignment? All right, <laughs> okay. Chapter seven, thank you. Uh, read chapter seven. What does chapter seven talk about? Okay, let's look at chapter 6 and 8 for just a moment. We'll get into the opening the Bible in just a moment. You're free to do that at any time, of course. But um, right now it's kind of overviewing generally statements and descriptions. Revelation 6 records the opening of six out of the seven seals. Not all seven, um, but we'll, we looked at that last week, the six seals. And the seventh seal is not open until chapter 8. But the first six, which describe the Antichrist, the false Christ, deception, the war, the famine, the pestilences, the martyrdoms, the disturbances on earth and in the sky, six out of the seven seals are mentioned in Revelation chapter 6. Important note, the seals are never called judgment or any word like that. Um, they're not called plagues, not called judgments, not called anything that God is punishing the earth. It's never mentioned in Revelation 6, never mentioned in Matthew 24 either. Um, we commonly call them the seal judgments and the trumpet judgment and the bowl judgments. Seals are never called judgments or any word that would suggest God's judgment, God's wrath, or God's punishment. Revelation 8 records the opening of the seventh seal, which introduces the trumpets. And if you will now take your Bibles and turn to that chapter, Revelation chapter 8. Revelation 8 begins with a very fascinating and thought-provoking statement. Verse 1. When he had opened the seventh seal, and he there is the Lord Jesus, when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Uh, as far as you know, absolute silence in heaven with the, at least the angels, the Lord, and, and the believers from previous time are there, but nobody's talking, nobody's making a sound. There's no worship going on. There's no trumpet signs, no noise in heaven for a period of half an hour. Seven angels are brought forth, and these seven angels have seven trumpets. Verse number six, these seven angels prepared themselves to sound. And I don't think the preparation is music preparation, learning how to play the, I don't think it has anything to do with that whatsoever. Um, I think because of the nature of these trumpets, what they're going to produce or introduce, they are preparing themselves spiritually, if you will. They're angels. I know they're not human beings. But we're about to announce terrible things upon the world. 
And I think it's that kind of preparation. If you have to go to somebody and give them bad news, you're going to pray. You're going to get your heart ready to share that news. I think that's what's taking place in verse number 6 by these angels who will be sounding the trumpets. Are the trumpets referred to as judgmental at all? Seals aren't. They never are. Matthew 24, Revelation 6, or the other. I should mention as well, I think it's Luke 21 um, and Mark 13, but they as well parallel Matthew 24. So it's not just Matthew. It's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three, say the same thing as the trumpet, or seals, excuse me. Look at Revelation 8, verse 13. The first four angels have sounded their trumpets. Verse 13, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. And the translators add an exclamation point there. The last, they actually should say last three, I'm sorry. The last three trumpets are called woes. Woe, woe, woe. And when those trumpets are sounded, and the word woe indicates, look out, something bad's happening. It's a word of warning, word of grief. When those three trumpets are sounded, they're called the first woe, the angel sounds, and the first woe, the second woe, etc. They're the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpets, but they are woes that are being, uh, that are coming. So that's a different description than the seals. The seals aren't called judgments. The trumpets are, they, at least the last ones. They're called woes upon the earth. The vials, chapter 15, if you'll turn there for a moment. Revelation 15 and verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And those seven last plagues are the vials. So we call them the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the vial judgments, the bowl judgments. The Bible never uses those phrases um, and never uses any type of judgmental language to describe the seals but it does use that language to describe the trumpets and the plagues, or pardon me, the trumpets and the vials. Those are the wrath of God. The seals are not. It's God allowing the world to, and Satan, to do what he wants, Antichrist to do some things. It's not God's judgment upon the earth. Those begin with the trumpets, and they get progressively worse. Whoa, whoa, whoa at the end. And then the last seven, those vile judgments, those are specifically called plagues. They are God's punishment to a sinful world. So that's the um, first part, first page of the search for the church. Chapter 6 and 8. Six things on earth are happening, unpleasant things, but it's not God's wrath. Chapter 8, that begins. The trumpets start, the vials soon after that. Next page, PWR at the bottom of the page, by the way, pre-wrath rapture, page 5. What does Revelation 7 record? In chapter 6, things happening on earth, the seals opened up. Chapter 8, God's judgments begin. What's in the middle? Chapter 7. Two different scenes are described. First of all, there's a scene on earth. Verse 1, Revelation 7. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. So he's looking at earth. John's given this vision of earth. I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. 
So on earth, there are 144,000 Jewish servants of God. They're called servants of God in verse 3. They were called to be out of the children of Israel in verse 4. And the following verses say there's 12,000 from Judah and the different tribes. 12 times 12,000. It is interesting, though, that um, the description of the 12 tribes is not the actual 12 sons of Jacob. And I haven't figured out why that is yet, but um, there's a, a difference there. So that requires a little more research, if anything, of any reason. But uh, 12 tribes mentioned, 12 tribes of Israel, but they're not the same 12 tribe names as the book of Genesis gives to us. But that's what's on earth, the 144,000. And at this point, they're just sealed. We're not told what they're doing. They're just at this time sealed before these angels unleash what they're doing. What about in heaven? What's taking place in heaven? Verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great number, pardon, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. That's what's going on in heaven, between chapter 6 and chapter 8. Chapter 6, things on earth, the seals. Chapter 8, God's wrath comes. Chapter 7, there's 144,000 Jewish servants of God sealed, but in heaven... And notice the language, verse 9, I beheld and lo, John said, where do these people come from? Um, it's like he glanced to earth, and then he looked around back where he's in heaven, and says he's now surrounded by a great multitude of people. Who are they? A great multitude which no man can number. Um, obviously, God knows the number, and... Paul says, the Lord knows them that are his. There's no secret numerically to God. But if you to stand and count one, two, three, four, five, you're going to lose track. No man can number this group of people. It's too big. Great multitude. Who is this great multitude? First of all, we're told they are from every nation, kindred, and people. Kindred is the word for a clan, um, family group, if you will. It could be somebody out of the Petros, for example. It's every family will be represented in heaven, at least every extended family, every clan, not every husband, a wife, a child, but every family unit, if you will, every family clan. Every nation, kindred and people, is represented in this group. Not represented, they are there in this group, members from them. They speak every language. All kindreds, pardon, all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, all languages. At least one person from every language, language will be at this group. They are clothed in white robes. Verse 9. Do you remember uh, last Sunday said to take note of this? I, I probably said that a lot, but um, go back to verse chapter 6, Revelation 6. And I start in verse number 9, the fifth seal, the martyrs. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for yet for a little while, a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. They were given white robes. I not say they were dressed, clothed in white robes. They were given to them. 
If I were to take out my jacket, which I won't do, but if I were to take this off and give it to Debbie, you wouldn't say I give it to you. It doesn't mean you're wearing it. You just you got it in your hands. That's the picture, verse 11, chapter 6, that white robes are given to them. They're not wearing them yet. There's no description, statement they're wearing them until chapter 7, verse 9, clothed with white robes. They are resurrected. They are wearing their garments, the garments of the right of the righteousness of Christ, the garments of their salvation, describing their salvation. These robes, robes are described later in Revelation 19. Um, same group of people, quite likely. But they are clothed with white robes. Something happened between chapter 6 and chapter 7. Those that were dead, chapter 6, holding on to robes, are now clothed with white robes. What happened? Who are these people? It's interesting. John has asked that question. Go down to verse number 13. One of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? They're wearing their garments. Who are they? Where did they come from? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. That means John has no idea. <laughs> um, you know, you tell me. And sure enough, he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of them shall feed them, shall lead them into living waters, living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Similar language that we'll see in Revelation 21. Um, no more tears, etc. But who are they? They came out of the great tribulation. And I looked it up, and Revelation 7, 14, at least my translation, King James, it says they came out of great tribulation. There actually is the article, the word the, in there. They came out of the great tribulation. If you remember when we studied the Mark of the Beast, whenever that month that was, several months ago, um, John MacArthur says this group in Revelation 7, this is a common view of it, is at the end of the tribulation, the end of the 70th week, Revelation 19, he, he basically trans, transfers, picks us up, and moves from Revelation 7 to Revelation 19, because it, it fits with pre-trib position. He views these as tribulation saints, not the church, but tribulation saints. Um, but look at that description. Every nation, kindred, people, language, a number which no, a multi which no man can number in seven years. Um, God can do anything. I, I'm not disputing that. God can save as many souls in a short period of time as he wants. He saved 3,000 one day, day of Pentecost. No disputing that is a possibility. But looking at where this is placed in the scriptures, chapter 6, events on earth, the seals, Matthew 24. Chapter 8, God's wrath begins. Chapter 7, a great innumerable group of people from all over the world, every language, clothed in white garments, resurrected, taken from earth out of the great tribulation to heaven. That fits you know, with the great tribulation followed by the rapture of the church, pre-wrath rapture. If you have that chart from last Sunday, and it's up here, I'll get to it in a moment. Um, the Great Tribulation followed by the Rapture. This fits perfectly with that position, that Revelation 6, 7, and 8 sequence. Things on earth, the Rapture, and then God's wrath follows that. So the search for the church. Again, it's true that chapter 7 does not use the word church. It's also true neither does chapter 4 and 5, so you can't 
prove or disprove anything from that. But you have. Is this not a good description of the church? A great number of people over 2,000 years, seven years a period of time, a great multitude that nobody can number. Hard to imagine that. But 2,000 years, all over the world, a great multitude of people that nobody can number. That fits with the description of the church. And the rapture of the church, after the seals, but before the trumpet and vial judgments begin, before God's wrath. I think the church, the search for the church ends in Revelation 7. That's the group right there, starting verse number 9, the group that came out of the Great Tribulation. Okay. I'm tempted to ask a question, but we'll move on. Here's some phrases that we use commonly or have heard commonly that aren't in the Bible. I mentioned a couple of these last week. Uh, the phrase perhaps today, neat phrase, neat basis for plaques and signs and bumper stickers, etc. But that's not in the Bible. Again, it's not to say it's automatically wrong because it's not in the Bible. The word rapture is not in the Bible. The word trinity is not in the Bible. It doesn't mean it's a false statement. But just to state the fact of it, the word phrase perhaps today is not in the Bible. Neither is the phrase any moment in the Bible. He can return at any moment. It's not in the Bible. He says he'll return in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, but not any moment. That he can return any moment. In fact, it doesn't say he'll return in a moment. It just says we'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Correct that. The phrase tribulation period is never found in the scriptures. I just read Lehman Strauss, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, at least Arnold Fruchtenbaum. We always call it the tribulation period. The Bible never does. The Bible never describes that seven year period of time as the tribulation period. You'll hear me saying that often just because that's ingrained in my mind. That's what we've always called it since I was a little boy. That's never the description the Bible gives to it. 70th week, time of Jacob's trouble, if you will, things like that. But the Bible never calls that seven-year period of time the tribulation period. And the Bible never uses the phrase tribulation saints. As I just said, uh, MacArthur and others say this group of people, Revelation 7, 9, is our tribulation saints. The Bible never describes use that phrase, tribulation saints. And to be honest, I might get in trouble here, but I don't think there is such a thing, that there are people during that period of time, we'll look at this in a few moments, saved during that period of time, apart from all Israel being saved. Look at that in a little bit. After the rapture, put it that way, excuse me. But the Bible never used the phrase, tribulation saints. The Bible does use a couple other phrases, and um, that we maybe don't think a lot about, but um, important phrases in understanding the timing of the return of Christ, the rapture of the church, and the event of it. The phrase in Romans eleven twenty five, the fullness of the Gentiles. Turn to Romans eleven, if you would please. Romans eleven twenty five. Romans nine ten eleven. The Apostle Paul writing to the church at Rome, talking about the nation of Israel. What's happened to them? They rejected the Messiah. Um, are they out of God's plan from now on? From that point on, is God done dealing with them? His answer is no. Romans 11 describes this tree, Gentile Jews cut off, grafted into the tree, the Gentiles, believers. Verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, and notice that word, mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. 
Right now, Israel is, as a nation, blind, partially. There are individual Jewish believers, individual Jews becoming believers. I mentioned Arnold Frutenbaum a few minutes ago. Jewish man became a believer in Jesus Christ. Not absolute blindness, not full blindness, but blindness in part has happened to Israel. That's a consequence of the nation rejecting Jesus Christ. The end of that is when the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Don't throw stones, please. Here's my understanding of this. A time is coming after which no more Gentiles will be saved. No more Gentiles will be saved. Fullness of the Gentiles. The word fullness means fullness, completion. There's no more. I've put several references using that same word. Galatians 4.4. 4. God sent forth, when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. Fullness of time, a certain exact point of time, not a random approximation, but a certain specific moment in time. Colossians 1.19 and 2.9 speaks of the fullness of the Godhead, the fullness of Christ, the fullness of the deity of Christ. He's fully God. He's not partially God. He's not 95% God. It's not 95% of the Gentiles be saved and some more are saved after that. The fullness. 1 Corinthians 10, it's not as significant doctrinally, um, but just as a picture, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Does God know, own everything in the world? Or just 95% or 99%? He owns 100%. The Bible uses this word, this word fullness to describe a complete group, number, full description, whatever that is. Use that same word to describe the fullness of the Gentiles. Not that every Gentile is going to be saved, but every saved Gentile will be saved at, up to this point. After that, no more Gentiles will be saved. So what's the point? What's the point in time? couple clues. Let it be. It precedes the salvation of all Israel. If you're in Romans 11, we just read verse 25, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Verse 26, and so, and the word so is actually the word for then or when, something on those lines. Um, it's not just that so is a consequence, but at that point, all Israel, at that point, but after that point, sometime relative time-wise to that, all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, they shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. The salvation of all of Israel, as I understand it anyways, I, I understand I could be wrong in this, but um, is every living Israelite at that time, not all throughout all history, anybody who died without Christ now, they're not going to be saved after their death. You're, once you die, there's no more changing your relationship to Christ. But every living Jewish believer, all Israel, will be saved at some future time. I think it's the second coming, the return of Christ. Let us see. If this is before the 70th week, if Romans 11.25, the fullness of the Gentiles, is describing an event before the 70th week, then there will be no Gentiles saved during those seven years. Tribulation saints, as it were. I'm not sure where um, you know, MacArthur and others would place this, but if you place the fullness of the Gentiles at the time of the rapture, you ever heard the phrase, this is another interesting phrase to think about, but um, when the last Gentiles say, last person saved, then the rapture, um, when is that? <laughs> If that's before the 70th week, fullness of the Gentiles come in, no more Gentiles. There's no five more percent to go. It's 100%. The fullness of the Gentiles describes 100% of Jewish, pardon, Gentile believers. Here's my understanding. Letter D. God will give time for the Gentiles to be saved until the time of the rapture. 
and that phrase, the church age isn't a biblical phrase either, but the church age will end at that point. Time for the Gentiles to be saved until the time of the rapture. In the pre-wrath position, that is three and a half years plus a few more weeks, months, or whatever, into the 70th week. Um, so it's not the, when the Antichrist signs that covenant, makes that covenant with Israel, that that's the deadline. It's until the time of the rapture that the Lord says, Gentiles, you can still be saved. But after that, his wrath will be upon them. His wrath will be upon them. No more opportunity for salvation. No evangelization. Church is going to be gone at that point. Gentiles, their last opportunity is until the time of the rapture. They have opportunity right now. They have another three and a half years at least. They have another, through the Great Tribulation, they can be saved. These are they which came out of the Great Tribulation. There will be people saved during that time. But not after that time. No Gentiles saved after that time. Revelation 14, verse 6, describes an angel. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. That's maybe the very last opportunity for Gentile salvation, this angel flying. Judgment is coming. Verse 8, There followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. This is what brought up the point of the... John MacArthur says you can take the mark of the beast and... Apologize for later, repent of it later, and still be saved. Not according to Revelation 14, 9 and 10, and this angel. If any man worship the beast, receive the mark in his forehead, he will drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Still on the earth, still facing the Antichrist, still have to make the decision who to worship, the Antichrist and Satan or the Lord Jesus Christ and God. Verse 13. I've used this verse, I don't know how many times, at funerals and the like. Unfortunately, I pulled it out of context. And it's a wonderful verse at any time for any believer. But notice the language here. I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, from this time on facing the Antichrist, resisting the Antichrist, being patient, keeping the commandments of God, keeping the faith of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to submit to the Antichrist. I'm not going to take that mark. You're going to die, quite likely. You're facing that. Blessed are the dead, though, which die in the Lord from henceforth. You are faithful to Jesus Christ, despite the threat of death by the Antichrist and Satan during this worst period of time on earth, the Great Tribulation period. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest in their labors, and their works do follow them. That is, those verses 6 through 13 describe the last opportunity for salvation of Gentiles. Gospel preached by this angel, and maybe others as well, I'm not saying just the angels preaching the gospel, but he's going all over the world, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, same description of people in Revelation 7. Last opportunity. Trust the Lord and stay true to him despite what that means physically, facing the Antichrist, facing death by the Antichrist. It's much easier to preach. It's much easier to hear. The blessed hope, Jesus Christ is coming. He could come today. I want to face the Antichrist. I want to face martyrdom. I want to face the great tribulation. Sounds wonderful. Um... We saw last week, did God ever promise us that we'll not face tribulation? 
The answer is no. In the world, you will have tribulation. He did say you won't face his wrath, and that's two totally different things. When God says no more Gentiles being saved, letter E, he will turn his attention to protecting and saving Israel. Protecting and saving Israel. Revelation 12, Israel goes off into the wilderness. They're carried in the wilderness for three and a half years. Satan wanting to attack them, wanting to kill them, as well as the church. The Lord will protect Israel, and ultimately all Israel will be saved. Every living Israelite will see Jesus Christ. They will look on him when they appear. So I think that's the moment of their salvation, and they'll be saved. Revelation 1, verse 7. So that's the fullness of the Gentiles. Gentiles still being saved, Jews still being saved. But at one point, God's going to say, no more Gentiles will be saved, but I'm going to save all Israel. Revelation 11. Another Bible phrase, the phrase, the day of the Lord, day of the Lord. Here's that chart we looked at last week and earlier today as well. Again, this time period here is kind of what we were just describing a little bit of in Revelation 14, probably kind of the tail end of that, if you will. Angel going out preaching, I'm sorry, Paul, um, the everlasting gospel. The rapture takes place, then people still being martyred, put to death. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. But then they're raptured. And that begins the day of the Lord, God's wrath. Pre-trip position says this whole seven years is the day of the Lord. As well, they often add the millennial kingdom, thousand years, the day of the Lord. Um, but what's the Bible say about the day of the Lord? The, yes, it says that, First Thessalonians 5. We'll look at that in a moment. Um, the phrase day of the Lord is found 24 times in the Old Testament, three times in the New Testament. A couple of times in the New Testament, the, the day of the Lord Jesus is mentioned, which I think is different. The day of Christ is mentioned a couple of times. Um, but the day of the Lord, just those few words by themselves, 24 and 3, the numbers. And every time you see that phrase, the day of the Lord, it always describes a time of judgment and wrath. Not a time of blessing, not a time of prominence, not a time of worship, salvation, etc., but time of judgment and wrath. And I put on letter C there, on how many numbers those are. I got all three of the New Testament references, Acts, 1 Thessalonians, and 2 Peter. Um, just a few of the New Testament references. But turn to that one in Amos. Um, Amos chapter 5. He's a colorful writer. Every time you look, though, I mean, you can just take out a concordance, find the phrase day of the Lord, and just kind of put your finger on any one of the references, look it up, and it's going to be talking about some punishment, some judgment taking place from God, not Satan or anybody else, but from God. Amos chapter 5, beginning verse 18. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light, as if a man did flee from a lion and met a bear. A bear met him, excuse me. Went into the house, leaned his hand upon the wall, and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark, and no brightness in it? Judgment, wrath, no escaping from it. No mixture of light in the darkness. Time of God's wrath. Acts 2.20 is quoting Joel, chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. I want to turn there just for a moment. Um, Acts chapter 2, we'll start in verse number 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. We're not drunk. Here's what's going on. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my 
handmaidens I'll pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show great wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Do you notice that description, what's going on? Heaven above, earth beneath. What we saw last week, the six seals. At least the sixth seal. Cataclysm in the sky, earthquakes on earth. It shall come to pass, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Judgment. Notable, great and notable day of the Lord come. Time of wrath and judgment. All right, next page. Do Jesus and Paul agree? <laughs> Silly question, of course, they're going to agree. Um, but if Jesus and Paul agree in this, we look at Matthew 24, we looked at last week. I'll turn to 1 Thessalonians, that's where I'll be at. If you want to keep your Bible in Matthew 24, feel free. Um, if you want to go back and forth. I'll just spend, uh, be reading from 1 Thessalonians 3 for the most part, because that's uh, 1 Thessalonians and 2, because we didn't get into these books last week. But things that Jesus said, pre-trib, dispensationalism, says Matthew 24, Jesus was talking to Jews, not to the church. But Paul's writing to a church, a Gentile church at that, not a Jewish church, primarily Jewish church. He's writing to a Gentile church, Thessalonica. Jesus said, the saints will face the tribulation. Then shall be great tribulation. And I'm just reading the, referring to the one verse, Matthew 24. Read the whole context if you want to, the proof that uh, I'm not pulling it out of context. Paul says, 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 3, we looked at this verse last Sunday as well. No man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. The word affliction is the same word tribulation throughout the New Testament. Thlipsis is the word. We are appointed to affliction, appointed to tribulation. Paul and Jesus agree on that. The trumpet sound. Matthew 24, 31, accompanying Jesus Christ, the sound of a trumpet at the return. Again, Matthew 24, the pre-trib and dispensational position is at that return of Christ at the end of the seven years, at the end of the 70th week. It's not the rapture, it's the second coming when it comes to earth, sets up the kingdom. Matthew 24 speaks of a trumpet sounding at that return. 1 Thessalonians 4:16 course says the same thing. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. So a trumpet sound accompanies the return of Christ, the rapture. Accompanied by angels. Matthew 24, 31 mentions that as well. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, we just mentioned, read that verse. Voice of the archangel mentioned there. But as well, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, To you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And angels in Matthew 24, angels speaking and writing specifically to a church, 2 Thessalonians, at the return of Christ. He comes in the clouds. Matthew 24, 30 states that. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. He comes in the clouds. Gatherings in heaven and earth. That is a key description. Let me go back and read Matthew 24, 31 again. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, 
and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. The four winds is earth. That's, we saw that in Revelation 14, the four corners and the four ends of the earth, four winds of the earth, from, from one end of heaven to the other. He's gathering the elect on earth, we which are alive and remain, gathering the elect in heaven as well. First Thessalonians 4, 17, 14 and 17, excuse me. Verse 14, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which believe which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him, the gathering of the elect in heaven. And then verse 17, caught up together with them in the air, those that are alive remains, a gathering of those on earth as well. And that's the rapture. Um, the second coming, there's no description of gathering. Um, he just comes to make war against the unbelievers. That's pre trip premillennial position. The rapture, he gathers, brings with him the dead in Christ, and as well raises the dead and catches away those that are saved, gathers the elect from heaven and earth. Sudden destruction after peace and safety. We didn't look to Matthew 24, 37 through 39 last week, but that's the passage that talks about Noah. As in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man comes. And what was it like in the days of Noah? Marrying, giving marriage, having dinners, just having good times, peace and safety, nothing to worry about. And then destruction comes, the flood. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, For when they shall say, and the word they is important, they the unbelievers, um, and the saints are going through the great tribulation. Saints, it's important to remember the great tribulation is Satan attacking the church, the Jews, it's not God's wrath. It's, it's peace and safety for the unbelieving world. They can walk into put that mark of the beast on their hands or forehead, buy whatever they want. They're fine. No peace and safety for the believers. They're being hunted like dogs. They walk into or without the mark of the beast, they're arrested, taken away, and executed. No peace and safety for us. But for them, when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as shall veil upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Sudden destruction after peace and safety. We're fine, and then God's wrath comes. Watch and be ready. And towards the end of Matthew 24, we didn't read that far again last Sunday, but the Lord says, watch and be ready. The Lord's coming again, such a day as you know not. 1 Thessalonians 5, we read these verses this morning, 6 through 8. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep in the night, are, they that sleep, sleep in the night, they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. You need to be watching, sober, awake, you need to be ready. Removed before wrath. The words of Jesus in Revelation 6 and 8, 6, 7, and 8. And the description of that group in heaven after the seals, but before the trumpets, before the wrath of God is poured out. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9. God hath not appointed us to wrath. 3, verse 3. We are appointed to tribulation. We are not appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Before wrath, we're raptured out of here. We're saved from the wrath to come. Removed before wrath. Spoken to um, or described in Revelation 6, as well as 1 Thessalonians 6 through 8. His appearing follows tribulation. Matthew 24, 21, then shall come great tribulation. And then Matthew 24, 29, and 30 describes his return, the rapture. The book of 2 Thessalonians says the same thing. Chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. It says, We ourselves glory in you, in the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, 
And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. To you who are troubled, to you who are tribulated, if you will, the same word, Philipsis, rest with us. His appearing follows tribulation, doesn't precede it. You're troubled, then the Lord shall be revealed from heaven. Tribulation comes, our tribulation comes from those who will be judged. Matthew 24, 21, then shall come great tribulation. He said, flee. When you see the Antichrist stand up, flee. Get out of there, hide. Because they're going to be coming after you. Those who are going to be judged are the ones who are causing the tribulation for the saints. It's not God. Seals are not God's judgment. That's man doing to man, Satan doing to men, Antichrist doing to men. It's not God. 2 Thessalonians 1 6, it's a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that tribulate, if you will, you, those who trouble you. They're going to face God. He's coming to rapture and to judge simultaneously. Matthew 24, you don't need to read those verses again, but he's coming. He's going to gather the elect, and he's going to judge the world. Second Thessalonians 1, 8 through 10. He's revealed in verse 7, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you is believed in that day. He's coming to be glorified, the saints, gathering the, the rapture, and as well punishing the unbelievers. Coming to rapture and to judge. Not divided by seven years. The rapture, and we can look elsewhere. Luke 17 seems to indicate the very same day they'll take place. The judgment will start. The church gathered at his coming. Matthew 24, 31 calls them the saint, the elect, excuse me. Um, Pre-trib says it has to be Jews, Jewish elect. Because I asked to, if you pre-trib, it has to, it can't be the church there. Um, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1, uses the same exact wording. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Not by their gathering, not by the Jews' gathering, but by our gathering together unto him. The church is gathered at his coming. Warning against deception. Jesus warned about that several times. Paul warns about it as well. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Don't be deceived. That's the whole base of Second Thessalonians. They were being deceived. A letter, false letter came to them. The revelation of the Antichrist. The abomination of desolation, Matthew 24. When you see that, Jesus says, the Antichrist, flee. Second Thessalonians 2, starting the last half of verse 3. The man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The revelation of the Antichrist. Paul and Jesus agreeing on that point as well. And one last point, and we'll be done. Evil, delayed, and restrained. Matthew 24, 15. It doesn't use the words delay, restrained, or anything like that, but it says, as Daniel prophesied, what did Daniel say about that? He put it to a specific day and time, the middle of the tribulation. The Antichrist, for the three and a half years, will be doing whatever he's doing, but he won't stand up in the temple of God until that point, that's when the midpoint is. That's when, pardon me, that's when he reveals himself, right smack in the middle. He may have wanted to earlier. That's delayed. Matthew, 2 Thessalonians 2 and now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. Satan may want to do this whole thing right now. Not yet. And not even the first three and a half years. 
the mystery of iniquity, iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth, now hindereth, restraineth, will restrain or hinder or let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. The Antichrist and the plan of Satan is delayed until that three and a half midpoint, then the Antichrist is revealed, then Satan pours out his wrath upon the world, and then the Lord says, that's enough, I'm cutting that short, and the rapture takes place. Jesus and Paul agree, even though the preacher position says Jesus was talking to the Jews, He's not, that's not for the church. What Jesus said, Paul says, not the point per point, six seals parallel, but what's that, 12 or 14 or so points that they agree on to the church as well as to the Jews. So called, said to the Jews. I think Matthew 24 is spoken to the 12 disciples as the church, not as the Jews. And that's what Paul states here. Okay, we're halfway done. Not for tonight, we're halfway done for the month. Excuse me. Um, but uh, thank you for your patience. So it's gone a little bit longer tonight. But uh, hope you'll go home now and search the scriptures, whether these things are so.